All right, so um, I've had a couple of people speak to me about how certain aspects of the lecture videos on DC motors have been uh, confusing at points. And, you know, that, that's somewhat unavoidable. It would have been the same in person. And, uh, uh, however, in person, you kind of get to fire away with your questions in the moment. Uh, I do have, remember, Zoom video uh, office hours. I would encourage you to drop into those. It's all, they're all posted on the calendar in Brightspace. If you click on the office hour link in the Brightspace calendar, there's links to the Zoom meeting. Just pop in there. I can sh answer whatever questions you might have. But I thought I would do a quick supplementary video here showing um, a DC motor. Well, this this thing, as the as the nameplate shows you, does a whole bunch of other things besides. But the basic thing is that it takes in DC input, just like our DC motors, and it creates mechanical motion. So right now, uh, I've got it hooked up to just zero volts. So there it comes leads, do, 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 do. and out of this thicket of wires, I figured out that these two wires are the ones that actually take the DC input. And then if we wanted like to you know, look at the AC output and DC output at different voltages from various other bits and pieces, you see there's a couple of different commutators in here, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a more complicated machine than our sort of standard brush DC motors, but it is, at its core, just a brush DC motor for what we're using it uh, for today. So, let's see. Let's turn this up to, eh, like a volt. All right, so as you can see, oh man, we're just barely getting enough torque to make it go a tiny amount. Now this thing is pretty old, it's not in the best repair, so there must be just enough mechanical load, enough friction between the various sets of brushes and all the little links and the commutators there and there uh, to resist the torque that it's feeling. However, if we then turn this thing up to say eh, like two and a half volts, there we go, now we're whirring away. Now as for the actual mechanism by which we're getting movement, just a quick summary, but refer to the lecture, other lecture videos for this. Uh, you've got current coming in here, goes in, comes into these, let me see if I can point appropriately here. There are a set of brushes. There's, there's my pointer. There are a set of brushes there and one there, right? So two brushes, one on either side. And remember that our commutator here, let me turn this back down so we can actually see it stopped, okay? Remember that these, uh, these commutators come with, here's my pointer, each one of these copper segments is connected to one end of a set of loops, and there's lots of sets of loops. I mean, you can see how many commutator segments there are. And each pair of commutator segments, so this one and then another one, like 180 degrees around the other side of this commutator, are connected to one set of loops, and then the next one over is connected to another set of loops on the rotor, and another set of loops, etc., etc., etc. Okay? And the point of all of that, remember, is to smooth out torque that you get on the rotor and thus whatever is connected to the rotor. Here, it's just like this little cooling fan that would keep this whole thing cool if it was operating at capacity. Uh, but you can imagine that it would be driving a propeller or another like larger fan blade or whatever it is that you wanted to turn and thus do useful work with. All right, so uh, let me turn the voltage back up. Get ourselves whirring along, that's three, let's turn it down. Two volts input. Okay, so two volts source voltage results in a fairly leisurely rotation rate. And remember that the thing that causes there to be a limit on the speed of the rotor is a couple of things. Okay. In the ideal case, if there's no mechanical load, so all the friction was nothing, we weren't having to turn this fan blade, etc., etc., then what would be happening right now is that the, 
voltage, um, the source voltage would be completely canceled by the counter voltage from the generator effect that appears on the, uh, on the armature windings. So on the windings, the, the loops of copper wire that are attached to this uh, commutator and are all on the, the rotor in here, okay? <clears throat> now, uh, in actuality, that's not going to be the case. It's not going to be completely canceling because that would mean that there would be actually zero current going through the armature windings. If that were ca the case, then you would have zero torque because Lorentz force is uh, proportional to the product of the current and the field. And if you don't have any current, then you can't have any force. And if you don't have any force, you're not going to have any torque. So. To have any torque at all to overcome like the friction of the bearings and the air resistance on the fan blades and all of those kind of things, you need a little bit of current going through the windings. So for uh, this particular example, I've switched it over to measure amps there. You see that it's measuring just under a half an amp flowing through the windings at this speed where we're supplying two volts from the source. Okay. So, if we raise the source voltage, though, right, if we raise the source voltage, then this thing should be able to go faster because then you can, uh, there'll be a bigger voltage to cancel, basically, right? Up, up to this point, the maximum possible countering voltage from the generator effect is about 2 volts, right? You can't, you can't generate more counter voltage than what you're applying. <clears throat> So if we raise it to like three volts, you can probably hear the whir in the back. Well, let's do three and a half, make a big difference. You can see that things are whirring along at a pretty larger rate. Even if you can't see it from the video, you should be able to hear the difference. And we can uh, check out a similar number of things. You'll note that the, uh, the current, basically the same, okay? which is telling us that the, what is that telling us? So that's telling us that the Lorentz force on the loops is basically the same as it was before. And that force is what's required to keep this whirring away at a constant speed. Remember that the key thing that sometimes gets lost in this is that <clears throat> there's some resisting amount of force and thus torque on this from air friction and friction from the, the brush and commutator surfaces coming in contact, all that kind of stuff. And uh, we need to have enough torque on the rotor from the input of electrical energy to counteract that torque if we want the vol rotor velocity to stay constant, right? If you want a constant rotor velocity, so like 100 RPMs or 1000 RPMs and just keep it at that, then you need all the resisting torques to balance out with all of the torque we get from the Lorentz forces, okay? So that's what this amount of current and the resulting amount of Lorentz force is doing for us. And because the amount of air resistance, I mean, yeah, we're moving faster, so theoretically the air resistance is a little higher, and then the current is a tiny little bit higher, but things like the, 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 the friction forces from the brushes on the commutator, that kind of stuff, since we're not really turning much anything else here, um, that is, is more or less constant. So the amount of current and thus the amount of uh, Lorentz force and torque, resulting torque from the Lorentz force that we actually need to keep this thing whirring away at this nice, well, relatively constant speed um, is fixed. So the amount of current that we actually get flowing through there is more or less fixed. If we pop it back over to um, voltage, and let's see, it can take up to 26.8 volt input, so I think we're pretty, you know, we're safe to ramp this up a little bit more. We might hit our current ceiling at some point. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, so five volts. We're definitely moving along quite, quite a bit more quickly. The flan blades probably look more like a blur on the video. And the corresponding sound. If we pop it over to amps, again, we're probably expecting a little bit more amperage, but not like huge amounts more. Yeah, here we go, a little bit more. So 0.5 instead of like 0.46. And if we pop it over to volts again, and we bump it up again, oh yeah. Field power. <laughs> I 
get maybe too excited about these things. But I, yeah. yeah. Uh, popping this back over there. Amps, okay. Took a second there to catch up. They're actually less now. So I'm kind of wondering whether we get up to a certain speed, maybe some of the friction effects on the rotor from the commutator brush connections uh, are a little bit less. But actually now that the, the current measurement has settled in, yeah, it's more or less in the same place, isn't it? Okay. So <clears throat> air resistance, not a big factor here. So it's just down to friction. So the resisting torque isn't very big. And so the amount of torque, which remember is the torque on the rotor that we're creating from the input of energy. Remember that's proportional to how much current we're putting in there. Since the current is about the same, touch more, but about the same, then suggests that the resisting torque isn't that much different because the two have to balance out to give us this nice, steady, whirring, rotational velocity that we've got, okay? If we were to have more torque on the rotor from the current running through it than the resisting torque, then we would expect the thing to accelerate. And that's what happens when we're sort of starting up and going from a motionless rotor to one that's moving. And if the resisting torque was larger than the torque we get from the rotor, then we would expect the thing to slow down. So in that case, remember that if we have a rotor that goes into a stall, like we were like, I'm not gonna do this because that's a mill fan blade moving fast, but if we were to like arrest the motor rotor right now, then we would see this big jump in current, okay? Uh, in fact, let's, let's just see, let's do the experiment live. I'm gonna turn this, oh, I'm gonna get it, I'm not gonna stick my finger in there in case you're, in case you're wondering, I'm gonna stick a pin in there, and I'm gonna turn it down to like four and a half volts, so it's still whirring along. Okay. And remember that the amperage is, you know, still right around a half an amp, okay? There's our little whirring fan blade, okay? And uh, what's going to happen probably when I stop this thing is that the current, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little, so I'm going to point it at that, I'm going to, oh, do you see that? So here, listen to the noise, because I can't really show you them both at the same time. But when I touch the rotor, so I put a resisting torque on it, that's gonna slow the rotor, that's gonna make the countering voltage drop, that's gonna raise the current going through the, the rotor as it tries to retain, as it tries to apply enough torque to balance the resisting torque. It's this lovely little negative feedback loop that happens all on its own, just from Lentz's law and Faraday's law. Do oh, so you see it bounce up to about 0.85 or something like that? So, see? So as you reduce the velocity of the rotor, current in the rotor is gonna go up because there's less counter voltage. Remember, countering voltage is proportional to the velocity of the rotor. So you slow the rotor, counter voltage goes down. Okay, that means net voltage across the armature goes up because the source voltage is still there. You're not canceling as much of it though. So more current flows through the rotor and we light up the little red thing, right? That thing that limits the current so that this thing doesn't burn itself out, all right? So anyway, I hope that helped you a little bit in understanding this stuff. And if it didn't, let me know. And if it did, let me know about that too. And I'll know my time was at least partially well spent. So see you later.